And speaking of Metallica, you know, having Guns N' Roses and Metallica play, I mean, you're a big Metallica fan, right? Yeah, absolutely. And is it pretty cool? I mean, do you remember the first time you heard Metallica? Yeah. Actually, the first time I heard them, I didn't like them. <laughs> but um, that was back in the first album, what, 82 or what, 84. And I, I mean, I'm absolutely a convert since I was a kid, really. And um, for the, to be playing with them now, it's amazing, you know makes for a good fun show well we're going to be back at rfk stadium in washington dc but right now let's play another guns and roses video this is sweet child of mine i'm sick of it <laughs> one thing that i thought was kind of interesting i know a lot of shows are like back to back now how do you do it because these stages the setup here is amazing i mean do you have another stage being set up at the other um arena or yeah we as soon as we're done we drive to the next place and start setting stuff up so it's the crew guys are just going nuts, right? No, oh, they stay and tear this one down. We put up the other one. Oh, so there, are, there are there are two different stages, right? The four of us. The four of us. It's just it's just, just set you up guys. our part, Dad. Yeah. This, you know. uh, I think the basic structure. I think they have a second one, but I'm not sure. Uh -huh. I don't I don't I don't work here, man. We got some people up in in New York to like build a drum kit on basically like a remote control like riser i'm like on this robot riser that one of our roadies sits and kind of he basically dr he, he drives me around the stage <laughs> which is pretty like the silliest thing anybody's ever heard of but it's really cool because i can basically go wherever i want up on the on the on the stage and it gives me a chance to feed off energy from different areas of the crowd and stuff like that and also we play every song basically in different configurations so it's it's cool it's something very different. cool yeah and we'll be looking forward to that in the show right now let's play metallica video here is Nothing else really matters. The edited version called Nothing Else Matters. You can hear, of course, with Duff from Guns N' Roses and uh, here, here in Washington, D.C. It's hot. And I just noticed when you just walked in, this is your first time really seeing the whole stage set up, yeah. isn't it? It's amazing. I mean, we had a huge uh, stage set up for Europe and, and before, but this is the first time I saw the expanded version, and it's amazing. Does it ever get, like, kind of awe-inspiring? I mean, walking into a place like this that fits, you know, 70,000 or so people and just sit, you know... I mean, because, you know, I've seen you guys since know, the know, know. old days, and it's still weird for me to watch out and go, wow, Guns N' Roses, and seeing this stuff in the stage and this. I mean, it's got to be wild. Well, when I come out, I mean, you know, we come out of these, these things back behind here when we come out, and you don't really see the audience, then you come out, and you don't hear, like, a single clap. It's just, like, a roar, and it's like, wow. And we, you know, we're a club band for the most part. But, I mean, I think we have the ability to bring you know, a huge place like this, kind of to an intimate type of uh, setting, as much as you can do <laughs> right. with 80,000 people. Yeah. We're going to be back talking to Duff and uh, hanging out here at RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C., but right now let's play a video from a band that's kind of starting off this whole big mega tour. Here is Faith No More with Midlife Crisis. This is the first day of the uh, tour that's about to kick off. And, and around how long is this tour going on for? Um, well, just over two months, man. We just got back from Europe for two and a half months, and, uh, this, but this is the tour, man. This is the yeah, tour. Yeah, this is this is pretty wild. I mean, Guns N' Roses and Metallica. How did the whole thing get set up between both bands? Well, I mean, as you know, I mean, we're both both bands are are good friends. We hang out in Hollywood and stuff together when they're there and when we're there, and uh, um, we just like at, I mean, literally at bars at bars and stuff. We we talk about wow we should tour together we should tour together and it finally came together after a lot of you know bold you know the kind of thing though that went through the bands before it really went Absolutely. to the managers like let's do a guns metallic it was like hey let's play together it was really all the bands that did it i mean you know when it came down to it you know it was the bands that made all the decisions you know and just got kind of legislated through the management and all that so yeah, so it's a band tour. It's like, you know, it's not a, it's not a corporate tour or nothing like that. It's set up by the bands. Right on. And uh, we'll be back be. here exactly at RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C. But right now you can lead to this video. 
Uh, November rain. I think I'm in this. So. I think I'm in it too. For like oh, you that are. much. That's right. <laughs> Here's GNR November rain. That was, of course, Metallica with Enter Sandman, the vid that basically catapulted the guys into the major force that they are today. Okay, if you want to know more about GNR, their humble beginnings and the struggles they went through, basically GNR, past, present, and future, get set because it's a special GNR MTV rockumentary coming up just after the break. Hey, you know it's the GNR Metallica weekend here on MTV. <laughs> Backstage with Faith No More at RFK in Washington, D.C. This is the first show of the World Wind Tour that's going on for... How long is it going on for? A couple months, as far as I know. And this, the other bands have, I mean, they've had albums out for a while, but this is really your first tour with a new album, right? Yeah. In yeah, America. It's, yeah, it's kind of strange, because, I mean, when you do a record, you usually expect to kind of start from the ground up, and starting out with a tour like this is a little awkward. Yeah, and so this is also your first response to see what the American audience thinks about the new record live, right? America, yeah. We've been a couple months in Europe, and they seem to like it uh, not very much. Hopefully, America... <laughs> how, how, how is Faith No More received over there? Uh, pretty well, actually. We got a good following. You know, it was the same thing over there, though. We were touring with Guns N' Roses, so it's hard to, like, really gauge, you know. Are you guys really here to see us, or are you here to see uh, that red-haired guy and his troop of clowns? So, you know, it's hard to say. <laughs> yeah, it's impossible when you open for people to know who likes you and what, for what reasons they're there. But it seemed like the response, like for the people that are out there today, they just want to see a lot of good music because, I mean, a lot well, of people are on, Guns, Faith, and Metallica fans. Let's get real here. I think all they want to do is throw underwear at us. <laughs> but you also asked for the underwear, so... Exactly. Yeah, I mean, people were throwing clothes up there. You, like, got a good clothes collection today? No, I just think it's us reaching out to the crowd, you know. <laughs> it's that bonding thing. You yeah, perform for them, they throw us. out clothes. Boy, do they reach to us today. A lot of reaching going on. Did you see those hands? I saw the hands in the clothes. They're going something like this. I, 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 and with that, let's play a video from Guns N' Roses. Backstage at RFK with Faith No More, and I know that you've played with Metallica before. You were on tour with Metallica, but this is your first time playing with Guns, isn't it? No, we played with Guns N' Roses before as well. So it's kind of like an old friend thing, sort of. Absolutely not. I'm happy to see Metallica and all. They're a bunch of good guys. A lot of fun. But having problems with Guns N' Roses? No, no, they have no problems, problems at, all. at all. Being treated quite well, actually. Yeah, everything going good so far on the first part of the tour. Yeah, everything went great. Have you ever been on a stadium tour before? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. This last tour we did with Guns N' Roses was a European stadium tour. We did uh, part of a stadium tour with Metallica as well. We did Billy Idol, Robert Plant. We're old hands at this, man. Let's see your stadium masters now. Stadium masters, that's exactly. right. Faith No More, stadium masters. Like, we open up for just about every band, but we just can't figure out how to do it ourselves, so we're probably destined to repeat this for at least another 30 years. Right now, let's play a video from Faith No More. Here is Epic. There's got to be some real quick, interesting stories about playing live with this band. Oh, yeah, everything's interesting. Every day, it's a new thing. Um, in Germany, one time, we had to play in a thunderstorm, like the worst thunderstorm we had in, uh, in 20 years in Germany. And we all were sitting out there watching all the fans and stuff, and they're soaked and everything, and we're dry because we have a roof. So Zach, Axel takes one look at him, steps out, gets soaked, made all of us step out get soaked matt came up from his drum stage got soaked dizzy poured a beer over his head of course got soaked yeah every day it's an adventure uh -huh. something new well, right now this is one taken live from wembley and they played this during the 1991 mtv video music awards and i remember kept on watching this because that was like one of the first times everybody in america was going to see gilby but and of he course, wasn't there. And we kept on saying, where's Gilby? And the camera just kept on missing you. I didn't well, know they were filming that song. <laughs> and then nobody knew that you were. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, here's Guns N' Roses, Live and Let Die. Metallica. 
now. Showing a big stadium tour like this and knowing where you guys started, I mean, it's it's quite amazing, the, the big rise of Metallica and this type of music. Why do you think that Metallica has become such a super group and that people are becoming more accessible to this type of music? Because we won't go away. We won't go away. We keep on coming to everyone's towns. We keep on getting played on stations and MTV. Well, let up, man. That's it. Because, I mean, because of your success, it has opened the doors for a lot more heavier metal, you know, mm -hmm. hating using the term heavy metal, yeah. but for a lot of other metal bands. I think, uh, I heard Kirk say the other day, it's kind of a, a thing, um, the way that it snowballed, you know, and gained momentum, and it just keeps going and going and going, and like this album, um, people were ready to hear a bit more of an edge, and we were a bit, you know, we were ready to give them our music that was... You know, still accessible, but still had the edge, too. You know, they were ready to hear it. We were ready to play it. And it kind of worked out good. It was all in finding a, a balance, you know, between those things, those two factors that Jason just, just spoke about. And, uh, you know, just, just finding finding where we can still like, keep that initial aggression and energy while, while making the music a little bit more easier to understand. And uh, evidently, we did something right, because things are happening. And... Uh, you know, now I see a trend. I see a lot of other heavy metal bands following suit and, like, you know, stripping down their sound and making things a little bit more concise. Bringing the vocals out and all that stuff, you know, different things. But that's kind of how it's been in the past years, you know. They see that something that works. And and especially in Metallica's yeah. vein, you know, and yeah. they can kind of go after that thing. Kind of, you know, always have been the leaders for that, that type of music. Right, right in the eyes. Yep. We're going to be back at RFK, unleashing the monster, Guns N' Roses, and Metallica. And right now, here's a video from Metallica. Here's wherever I may roam. Guns N' Roses, Metallica, and Faith No More. Very amazing show. I mean, I can't remember a show this big. This is one definitely for the fans, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's a good package. <laughs> you yeah. laughing about that? Uh -huh. Yeah, we're doing it for the kids. I'll be there. <laughs> one thing I wanted to say, you got, like, these guys right over there that have been, like, following you around for, about, away a from us. for about a year or so. Uh, it's been even longer than that. It's been two years. They, they started when we were in the studio. Mm -hmm. They've been around this entire time, and I'm sick of them. <laughs> and so what is this going to be for? Some sort of home video? or? Yeah, we're probably going to put a bunch of this together and then uh, probably throw it away after we look at it. <laughs> now we're going to put it out in some kind of home video form mm -hmm. just to kind of show us really how boring we really are. Now, was there a time that you, I mean, back a couple of records ago, you guys really didn't think you were ever really going to do videos, did you? No. <laughs> I mean, one was the first video, and now you guys are doing videos for every single, right? Well, I mean... It's kind of the way it is. And now we've gotten better at it. <laughs> Let's play a Metallica video. Here's the first video from Metallica. Here's one. This young man will be as unfeeling as... Ricky Rackman here with James and Kirk from Metallica. And we were talking about the tour and the sound checks and all the things about playing this. I mean, this is a pretty big place, right? Yeah, it'll do. <laughs> you guys, I mean, the, the thing that, that I'm kind of curious about is, you know, this place, Metallica pr could probably play by themselves. And Guns could probably be play by themselves. And you guys decided to both bands go on the road, right? Yeah, it's cheaper that way. <laughs> is, it, is it really? Because I would imagine, I mean, with both of you guys having your own stage, for instance, you do have the Snake Pit, right? Yeah, we're trying to incorporate that into outdoors, which is not the easiest thing, but uh, we're going to try and make it work. And for th I think we should call it the Sunstroke Pit. <laughs> for those that haven't been to a Metallica show yet, you might want to explain what the Snake Pit is. Well, it's a section on, on, on the stage, well, in this case, it's slightly off the stage, where people sit. They're trapped. Yeah. <laughs> and it, they have it, to listen to it. Yeah, exactly. It just it enables these people, these people to to see the band up close. I mean, real close. Yeah, you're in basically in the middle of the stage. Yeah, spitting distance. It's sweating and spitting distance. Because the way I kind of looked at it, it would give almost the fan or person just like 
you and me out there the perspective of what it's like for you guys on stage because you get to kind of look out in the audience which is kind of different way to look at it yeah uh -huh. it's, it's pretty cool because you you definitely get to see what the band is seeing mm -hmm. also which in this case is about 60,000 people 60, 70,000 fans I know well, why don't you uh, tell us the video we're about to play now uh, it's some video that I don't know what the hell it's all sure. about. This you is know. easier. <laughs> there it is. Don't know what it's all about, so you figure it out. The unforgiving. We're back at RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C., and I want to remind you that in 45 minutes, you're going to see a brand new Metallica documentary, which is pretty cool. It's not only brand new, it's also the first one. <laughs> not to be confused well, with all the other Metallica well, documentaries, which <laughs> never existed. So, the new improved, the first Metallica documentary. One thing I want to ask you about, you on the last sh tour, which is still sort of on hiatus in a sense, you, you did, had your drum set move up, and then I guess on the other side it moved up too? Yeah, and well, I guess, you know, the idea was to since we were playing quote-unquote in the round that the drum kit would basically move all over the stage except it didn't really move all over the stage because there was one that moved all over one side and one that moved all over the other side but destroyed the whole thing right but you didn't really see both of them together until like me and James did this really silly drum solo so it was pretty cool just get, as a drummer getting a chance to flip around and get energy and, and stuff like that from audiences all over the different areas of the, of the arena and stuff like that. So we've kind of taken that concept a little further on this tour and uh, we've got some people up in, in New York to like build a drum kit on basically like a remote control like riser. I'm like on this robot riser that one of our roadies sits and kind of, he basically dri he, he drives me around the stage, <laughs> which is pretty like the silliest thing anybody's ever heard of, but it's really cool because I can basically go wherever I want up on the, on the on the stage and it gives me a chance to feed off energy from different areas of the crowd and stuff like that and also we play every song basically in different configurations so it's it's cool it's something Very different cool. yeah and we'll be looking forward to that in the show right now let's play metallica video here is nothing else really matters the edited version called nothing else matters Washington, D.C., Metallica right there, James right there, doing the song that actually attracted me to Metallica, Seek and Destroy, I think the first probably coolest song done by Metallica, I dig it. Anyway, we'll be back, and when we come back, we're going to be talking to Lars from Rove Metallica, but right now, let's watch the video, you might recognize the guy going, here's Guns N' Roses, November Rain, we'll be back at RFK, Washington, D.C., part of the killer show ever. Ricky Rackman here backstage at RFK in Washington, D.C. Here with Lars and Metallica backstage where it's a nice cool 98 degrees yeah, probably. Yeah. And we, you know, we're sitting here, the air conditioner is blasting it. It's still, you know, it's about 98 degrees. I think it's closer to 99, but I won't disagree with <laughs> your host in front of you guys. Because I'm the guy with the mic. Now, for now, for now, see, this is, there's this thing about Lars possibly taking my job, and I said, hey, if I can play drums, I'll switch. Anyway, what do you think one of the reasons of the uh, success and appeal of Metallica, because I have my own reasons, uh, other than the music. It's, it's down to just one mere fact that we're all incredibly handsome and good looking, that's the only thing. No, see, we know it's not that. Yeah. Oh, but thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that's always one of these questions that's real difficult to answer with a straight face or without sounding, you know, full of yourself. I would like to think that we offer something a lot of kids can relate to, that they can relate to, that we're real straightforward with them, that we maybe play some music pretty different than a lot of other bands do, and that we just have an attitude that just comes across as being very real, and, and just it's something that I think a lot of kids can just relate to kind of an on-the-level thing, that it's not like this larger-than-life rock star crap. This is actually like four guys actually enjoying what they're doing, not doing it for the money or, or this other crap. You know, it's like 
here we are, real people playing real music. Because you know? that's what I was thinking. I mean, the people that are out there watching Metallica, I think, can relate to you and say, hey, I could be that guy if I could have played that song. Yeah. And I don't want to be doing music just like Metallica, because your and, jeans, yeah. t-shirt kind of And guy. I'm better looking than him, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, the Metallica rockumentary is only five minutes away, but right after this break. here with Metallica, the hot new heavy metal band from L.A. And let's have them start with their name and what they do in the band. And let's start with you. James Hetfield, rhythm guitar and vocals. Lars Ulrich, drums and bongs. Dave Mustaine, lead guitar. Cliff Burton, bass guitar. Do it loud, do it fast, and do it yourself. That's the new metal motto of Metallica, a band that after a decade of hard work and sonic enterprise, truly rules. The band's story begins back in the spring of 1981. Glam was still king on the L.A. scene, but Danish-born drummer Lars Ulrich was looking to start a very different sort of band. Fortunately, a singer and guitarist named James Hetfield and his friend Hugh Tanner were looking for a drummer. We met up with him in a, a little room. Uh, it was Irvine, California. And uh, <clears throat> he had this drum kit that was uh, was kind of like a Muppet kit, you know? <laughs> it, was, it was not a real kit or something. It had about 10 different colors on it. And he had one cymbal that every time he'd hit it, it would fall over and we'd have to stop. Nothing came of that initial encounter, but Ulrich did later get an offer to do a track for a metal compilation album. He had no band, but he remembered his meeting with James Hetfield. Lars had called me back, got a hold of me, and said he knew this guy, Brian Slagle, who was putting together this uh, compilation album called Metal Massacre. Me and James, you know, wrote this song together called Hit the Lights. The review in, in some of the magazines in Europe said this was the worst sounding song the guy had ever, like, heard. You know, it was the worst recording that this guy had ever heard on, on an album. We tried to recruit other guitar players. Uh, <clears throat> our bass player, Ron, who I was living with, uh, was, was in the band for a, quite a while. Um, we tried all kinds of different guys, local, you know, from beach bums to Hollywood rockers. One day, I'm sitting in my house and the phone rings and it's, this guy just gets on the phone. And so, Hey, I got all this equipment and blah, 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 just motor mouthing off. And I got my own photographer and I got my own driver and I got my, I'm like going, huh? And uh, it turned out this was this guy named Dave Mustaine. What Metallica actually did was you, you watched four guys get together, these, these mad nuclear physicists or whatever. And uh, we kind of spilled some chemicals into a drum and boom, here you go. Speed metal defined. With its initial lineup complete, Metallica started clubbing around LA in March of 1982, pounding out covers by such underground British metal bands as Sweet Savage and Blitzkrieg. Then the band whipped up seven original songs for a demo tape to circulate, the now near legendary No Life Till Leather. I would send like five tapes out, and those five guys would, you know, copy them and send them to, you know, five other guys, and those five, you know, and it would just spread like, like wildfire. and. Within like uh, a couple of months, like the whole underground around the country and also in Europe just knew about Metallica. Metallica's first lineup seemed stable, but something was missing. And Ulrich and Hetfield realized what it was when they caught a band called Trauma at the Whiskey in Los Angeles one night and were knocked out by the group's bassist, Cliff Burton. He just had this stage presence and this visual thing about him that was just incredible. You couldn't tell what he was playing, but... Uh... And we looked a little closer, and it was the bass guitar. And he was he had these wild noises coming out of it, and you know, his head wouldn't stop. It was on a swivel, you know. Uh, we we pretty much knew he was our kind of guy. After three months of wooing and the band's agreement to move up to San Francisco, Cliff Burton agreed to become Metallica's new bassist. Soon after, the group got a phone call from New York from a man named John Zazula, or Johnny Z. He'd heard their tape, and he wanted them to relocate to the East Coast and record for a new label he was starting called Megaforce. We hopped in this U-Haul with uh, all the gear. We were sleeping in the back on the way, drove straight there. Uh, and uh, we kind of found out on the road how Dave was, <laughs> uh, which was, uh, he had a, had a few drinks and uh, got a little, 
out of control, you know, towards our friends and us, which was not gonna, not gonna work. We were, you know, real into the family kind of vibe, and if it wasn't, you know, we didn't need anything screwing it up. Uh, so the first thing when we met Johnny Z was, hi, we're here. Uh, you want to get rid of our guitar player? <laughs> My feelings were hurt, and, you know, I still think of them all the time. It's been kind of hard for me getting to the point where I can accept all of that because, you know, um, there was a lot of jealousy and a lot of me dealing with what was going on in my head watching these guys achieve this stellar uh, position in the industry that I'm still working in. The decision to dump Dave Mustaine from the Metallica lineup immediately created a major problem, finding a wildly talented replacement. Fortunately, the band was already aware of another San Francisco Bay Area band called Exodus and its remarkable guitarist, Kirk Hammett. I was in the band almost instantly and a week later, we were gigging all over the place and living this, <laughs> this subterranean lifestyle. We had to live in this, uh, it was called the Music Building. It was in Jamaica, Queens. Uh, other bands would come in and rehearse there and go home, you know, and sleep in a nice little bed. And uh, you weren't even supposed to, you know, be there past midnight or whatever. But uh, we knew all the people there. We were sleeping in the, you know, the corners and the, you no know, packing material, how our amps got there, you know. The band in the next room over was Anthrax. And uh, they felt sorry for us, so they gave us a toaster oven and a refrigerator. thing that happens to you when you for the first time stand there and like actually like hold your own album you know and, and Metallica and see your picture and songs that you've been playing for a couple of years and I mean that was a very heavy thing after their kill em all for one tour the band considered hiring armored saint singer John Bush to be Metallica's front man freeing James Hetfield to concentrate on his guitar playing Bush declined however and so Metallica pressed on starting work on the album that would elevate the band to a new creative level Ride the lightning. I think it, it showed all our fans and so on that we were not the kind of band that I think was going to be in the pile of, of predictable bands and uh, that hopefully we set the tone for the rest of the 80s. It'd be something big and fancy, you know, it's just us doing what we do. Let's yeah. keep it that way. Bring the music more across instead of the look. Not try and hide anything. In March of 1985, with virtually no radio airplay, Metallica's Ride the Lightning album peaked at number 100 on the Billboard chart, an astonishing accomplishment given the lack of industry support. Encouraged and more determined than ever, the band parted ways with Johnny Z and his Megaforce label, hired new management, and signed with a major U.S. company, Elektra Records. Metallica spent the second half of the year in Denmark recording a third album called Master of Puppets. At that time, we were just getting out of that mode of, you know, listening to nothing but, you know, the most extreme music there was. Tried to create a little more mood swings into things, and incorporate more acoustic work to, you know, make the heavier stuff and heavier, you know, dynamics and things like that. We started learning uh, harmonies, which Cliff was really good at. He took music theory. He was basically teaching, at least myself, a lot about harmonies and how, you know, how they intertwine, how they work together. Do you all know Cliff Burton over here? When we heard we got the Aussie tour, it was like, ooh, you know, there we are, this is it. Things are going real well. 55 minutes, you know, all our stage set up. It's real cool. We'd get up and uh, at soundcheck, we'd be doing, you know, old Black Sabbath songs and, you know, God, maybe tomorrow he'll get up and sing with us or something, you know. Things were rolling along. I mean, Massive Puppets went like top 30 album and the Kill Em All and Ride the Lightning like re entered Billboard charts and we had like all three albums on at the same time and there was a lot of things going on. The Ozzy Osbourne tour was a career peak for Metallica, and when the band decided to take a break from it to play some headlining dates in Europe, the members weren't expecting to suddenly go crashing down to rock bottom. But on September 26, 1986, tragedy struck. I couldn't sleep on the bus uh, 
in this top bunk. It was it was too drafty. And my throat, you know, was getting screwed up. So I had I'd always go sleep in the back lounge. We couldn't get it all together. We were arguing with each other and saying, well, you know, I want your bunk. Well, I want your bunk. Blah blah blah. I've never told anyone this, by the way, but um. Our manager said, well, why don't we just draw cards? We said, sure. So we shuffled the cards, said highest card gets first choice of bunks. So, you know, I, I reach for a card and I, I pick two of hearts. Cliff reaches for a card and he gets ace of spades. You know, James gets a card and Lars gets a card. So Cliff has first choice of bunks. So he says, I want your bunk, Kirk. I go, fine, fine, you know. So he gets my bunk. I, I end up with a bunk in the front of the bus, which was like not as good. And that night the accident happened, and uh, it was a horrible thing because you know, Cliff was in my former bunk. What happened that night was that um, the driver supposedly hit a patch of ice, and the bus skidded. It shattered the windows, and Cliff got thrown out of the bus and the bus landed on top of him. And uh, when it actually happened, I got thrown out of my bunk and knocked unconscious for like three or four seconds. And when I got, when I came to, I heard everyone screaming, but I didn't hear Cliff. And I instantly knew something was wrong because I didn't hear him. And I got out of the top of, of the bus because there's an emergency hatch at the top, very top of the bus. And I turned around and there was Cliff. And I just said, oh, my God. And I walked away, and I just, I was in, in absolute shock. And uh, I, just, I, I was delirious. I was in shock. I was hysterical. Everyone was screaming and crying. It was, it was too unreal to just deal with. It was like, you know, this doctor came into the room that I was in the hospital and told me that a bass player had died. And that was... It was just too unreal. Uh, just I remember our tour manager at the time, Bobby Schneider, said, uh, uh, you know, after everyone was kind of taken care of there, he said, you know, let's let's get the band and go to the hotel and he said you know when he said band it was like mm, it's not really a band right now and uh, we couldn't really grasp it for a while we had to sit down and, and actually face this um, you know what were we gonna do we, we realized that that the last thing that Cliff would obviously want us to do and, and we just we couldn't stop now there was the you know, metallic had always been about going against whatever would come come our way and just sort of carrying on. We weren't really looking for a Cliff part two. You know, someone who could like solo a lot and someone who was really eccentric like he was in his own way. They'd come in with their bass and they'd plug in and start fiddling around and you knew right away, it's like, ugh. We had the little, the little signal, you know, <laughs> that we'd, uh, you know, it was like, see ya. You know, you could tell, you know, he's like, bap, 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 you know, doing this funky stuff. It's like, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> next. One day, this kid named Jason Newstead just walked in, and uh, it was pretty obvious that there was something about him that was pretty different. It wasn't just about playing bass. There's so much more to it, and those guys knew it, and I knew it. Deciding immediately that the band had to go on, the surviving members of Metallica set their sights on a new bassist, Jason Newstead, from a band called Flotsam and Jetsam. They chose their local hangout, Tommy's Joint, to tell him the good news. I think I said it was part of the test, too, was to see if I could kind of hang and have, you know, beers and keep, uh, keep myself together. So me, James, and Kirk kind of ended up meeting in the bathroom up here, and uh, we were standing there relieving ourselves and basically looked at each other and said, is that the guy? And we just kind of all just, you know, nodded and said, yeah, that's him. We came back, sat down around this very table. I said, so do you want a job? When I said... Yeah, and I just got a little nutty and started screaming a little bit, you know. I just basically looked at him and I said, hey man, want a job? And this is what he did. Woo-hoo! It's 
scared everybody out of the establishment. <laughs> and, then, and then we thought twice about this. I knew there was going to be tests, and I knew that people were going to be messing with me here, messing with me there, trying to figure out if I was going to be the right guy for the job. And uh, that's certainly what happened. And it came from, from all ends, you know, it came from crew guys and friends and family and whatever. But uh, stuck it out, and here we are six years later. Eleven days after Jason Newstead officially became Metallica's new bassist, the band embarked on its first tour of Japan. Next came an EP of cover tunes, Garage Days Revisited, and then the group started work on its next album, And Justice For All, a collection of very extended tracks that would eventually become Metallica's first top ten hit and spawn its first music video. It is impossible for a decelebrated individual to experience pain, pleasure, memory, dreams, or thought of any kind. This young man will be as unfeeling, as unthinking as the dead until the day he joins them. We really realized that you could use the, the medium of video to do you know a creative thing just as much as, as records or anything else and 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 right then i knew that that we definitely entered into the uh, video age just like everybody else had 10 years before us <laughs> Now you're supposed to put makeup on and James like ran in the other direction and stuff like that. It was like hilarious. And Justice For All was nominated for a Grammy Award, and Metallica itself became the first metal band to play at the award show. Unfortunately, in a now notorious incident, the group lost the Best Metal Band Award to Jethro Tull of all acts. The band soldiered on, though, winding up a tour, taking a nine-month break, and then starting work on a collection of surprisingly shorter songs produced by hard rock veteran Bob Rock that would become the biggest Metallica album to date. We're taking those 10-minute mini epics and that whole progressive side just about as far as it could go. Concentrated more on just one riff through the whole song, which was just as, you know, just as challenging instead of trying to jam 100 riffs into one song. The first song that we wrote was Anna Sandman, and it was like that really set the kind of tone and the course for the new album because it did prove to us that for the first time we could actually write a short song, a simple song. Even the packaging of the album is a bit more simplistic. It's none more black. So, here it is, guys. None this all your first. This all your first, huh? None, none Pretty more. exciting, huh? I think we've reached a, a different level now with this record, definitely. Oh, it just shows that Metallica has more to offer than just going fast all the time and, you know, 240 beats every song and just blasting your brains out. Yeah, I really wanted to come in as a drummer and, and try and, and really lay back and, and get some kind of a groove thing happening. It's crazy, I know. The rhythm section of Metallica is crazy because Lars has always played with just the guitar. Never had any bass coming through his monitor or anything. So uh, on this album, we figured out that the drums and the bass need to play together. Boom, boom, chick, boom, 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 chick, to lay down a cool foundation for a song. I'm not trying to, to, to play 10,000 notes crammed into four bars or anything like that. Um, I'm trying to get a bit bluesier. Singing-wise, had to, you know, had to, had to sing on this one <laughs> instead of just yelling in key. Metallica 
to unveil its unusual new album at a special listening party for fans at New York's Madison Square Garden. The record went straight to number one in this country and topped the charts in 14 others as well. It also got the band invited back to the annual Grammy Awards show, and this time they didn't go home empty-handed. I want to thank all the radio stations and MTV, without whom, without whom, all this was possible anyway. Whoa! <laughs> just kidding, guys, just kidding. People are opening their eyes. They were afraid, I think, before, and now uh, they have to deal with it, no matter what. We're basically a live band, and... You know, we, we we enjoy playing live, and we do, we en enjoy being able to put on a great show. I mean, that really means a lot to us. See, this pretty much says it all. Heaven and hell. Up there, you go to become a rock god. Once the lights go down and the intro music starts, it's, there's no kind of really reality. It's all, it's all just <laughs> <laughs> know the integrity is there they've put us where we are you know whether we like it or not <laughs> metallica it's just it's my life and i could not ever picture doing this with anybody else or another band name and i think that the day metallica sits down and says okay you know no more let's give this a respectful ending I'm just going to do something else. I mean, it changed everything in my life, of course, you know. It was like, a, it was a dream for me to be able to even get into this band. So, I mean, it means everything. It means everything. It means a lot to me to, to know that I haven't sold my soul to do it either, you know. I have, I've, I've stuck to what I've believed in, as well as, you know, the other three guys. And we've, we've done it in a very honest way. There's no doubt that uh, we've grown up as a family in the band and uh, learned a lot of things from each other and together. And uh, there's no way I would change it or anything. <laughs> something new, have somebody else answer that, but maybe, maybe we really did. <laughs>
<laughs> Very cool. That was the Metallica rockumentary. And we're about to play some live Metallica videos, including one that you haven't seen on MTV, which is, I'm stoked because I haven't even seen this. And obviously, it was a concert that was in Moscow, so I wasn't even there. This is, uh, this is Fate to Black, which was uh, obviously, like you said, from the gig, which was the last gig on the European tour we did with ACDC. Moscow, there's about, you know, 14 zillion people there. And the one thing I just want to tell you guys is that there's been a lot of people who think that this song advocates suicide or promotes suicide. We've had some flack in the newspapers for that. And obviously anybody who knows about Metallica knows that that's obviously not the case. We're never trying to promote or sell anything like that. And the one thing that it always annoys me about the media is that they, the one or two incidents where something bad has happened with this song, Fate to Black, they never talk about all the kids that always come up to us backstage and, and send us letters and stuff like that and say how the song Fate to Black really changed their lives and helped them through some really bad times and really made a difference in their lives and stuff like that. So this is Fate to Black from Moscow. And actually, this song is also part of a home video that's coming out called for those about to rock in Moscow or something like that. It uh, features us and ACDC and the Black Crows and Pantera and a bunch of other cool bands and uh, should be coming out soon, so check it out. This is Fate to Black, we're Metallica, and this is filmed in Moscow, and it's actually pretty cool.
about to play Enter Sandman, which is you guys completely different from Moscow, playing live at the 1991 MTV Video Music Award. Capitalistic L.A., yeah. It was, uh, actually that gig was in the middle, we were doing like the seven weeks of the Monsters of Rock in Europe with ACDC, and in the middle of that, we had like three days off, and both us and actually Queensryche jetted over to, um, to play at the uh, Universal thingy and do the MTV Awards, and then like we were back on a plane the next morning and back playing in like Munich, Germany or Frankfurt or something. And uh, this was, uh, I think this was our second ever live appearance on TV. We'd done the Grammys a couple of years before, and I was really happy with the way this uh, MTV Awards came out. And this is, uh, and I'm saying, man, this is uh, right when we were like our fourth week at number one in um, in America. It was great to be back. In and it's coming up on the way, Enter Sandman from the 1991 MTV Video Music Award. So stick around.
live and are right in the midst of playing a bunch of live Metallica stuff that you usually don't see that much on MTV. And we're going to be playing Sad But True from Down the Green, which was kind of cool because you played Down the Green in 85. Yep. And then we were back uh, just last year, too. Headlined it. So it's quite a day for us, no doubt. And, and also we will be playing a Down the Green on this tour. So this will be your third time playing it? Yeah, it will. And isn't that your hometown? Sort of. Uh, that's where we're based. We've been there for 10 years, so we consider it home. So it's got to be pretty cool because, I mean, growing up in the Bay Area, you've always known the Down the Green shows to be these huge shows and to be headlining and then playing it, headlining it twice, I assume, right? I, I think yeah, well, the Faith No More guys are kind of based there, too, so it'll be fun for them, no doubt. Uh -huh. yeah, I think we're going to be one of the only bands who have played, who have played two head, uh, or headlined two Down the Greens in one <laughs> year. And played three times Down the Green. Yeah, and played three times. There you go. Okay, well, let's play it here, Sad But True, and this was from Down the Green in 1991. 